Good morning, and welcome to our worship service for Baptism of the Lord Sunday, January 10th, 2021. Don't forget, we're having communion this Sunday, so be sure to get your communion elements ready for later in the service. Be sure to express your appreciation to the outgoing elders for their service over the past two years, especially Gloria Eckert and Pam Knight. Uh, Jim Richards also, we can thank him, but Jim signed on for another two-year term, so it's not like he's going away from active service right now. Uh, at the December meeting, Session did plan to continue with online worship only for the month of January while we continue to monitor the situation. So we appreciate everybody's flexibility and willingness to just stick with us as we keep trying to figure out the best path forward for everyone. Per capita. Uh, this past year, the Presbytery of Des Moines decided to keep the per capita amount the same. So it will remain $45 per member. If you are able and interested in making a gift and noting it as per capita this year, that helps us to be able to, to pay everyone's per capita dues to the denomination. The year-end reporting. All committees and organizations of the church are asked to submit their 2020 reports by the end of January, by the 31st, to be used in the 2021 annual congregational report. So if you're head of a committee or part of a group as part of the church, just uh, talk to Ann or talk to me and be sure to get your report in by the end of January. We haven't set a date yet for the annual meeting. Session will discuss that at their January meeting. The rest of the announcements are the usual stuff. Don't forget about the birthdays and anniversaries. There are a few of those this week. Be sure to let folks know that you're thinking about them. And now, let's begin our time of worship. Please join with me in the call to worship. In the beginning, darkness covered the deep, and God said, let there be light. God said through the prophet, when you pass through the waters, I am with you. Do not fear, says the Lord, I am with you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When Jesus was baptized by John, suddenly the heavens were opened. And as Jesus came out of the water, the Spirit of God rested on him like a dove. And a voice said, You are my beloved Son. With you, I am well pleased. Our first hymn today is Baptized in Water. to confession. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sin as we come before God in prayer. Merciful God, in baptism you promised forgiveness and new life, making us part of the body of Christ. We confess that we remain preoccupied with ourselves, separated from one another. We cling to destructive habits, hold grudges, and show reluctance to welcome one another. We allow the past to hold us captive. In your loving kindness, have mercy on us and free us from sin. Fulfill the promises of our baptism 
so that we may rise to new life and live together in grace. Amen. As a voice from heaven said to Jesus, so in Christ God speaks to us. You are my child, my beloved. With you I am well pleased. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. We'll continue with the Gloria Patri, and then you'll see a short video with the blessing of the prayer shawls. church and the community have put together and Ellie has wonderfully put all these tags on them for us which is great so that folks will know they'll have a little prayer for them too when they receive them so we are going to say a blessing over all these shawls so that we can start to distribute them so let's pray dear God we thank you for the many hands that have made such a beautiful work we thank you for the gift of comfort that they will bring to all who receive them. We ask your blessing on all of these shawls, that they may be a source of comfort and of strength and a reminder of your love and grace to each and every person who receives them, and not just them, but their families and their friends as well. We know that these can be so uplifting at a time when people are feeling so very low. May your love and your strength go with them to all the different places that they will be so that they can be a blessing to them as you, Lord, have been a blessing to us, giving us the gifts and talents to be able to share in this very meaningful and beautiful way. We ask your blessing on all these shawls and on all who made them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, verses 1 through 22. In the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip, ruler of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, ruler of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then should we do? In reply he said to them, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He said to them, collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, and we, what should we do? He said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation and be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation, 
and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah. John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. But Herod, the ruler who had been rebuked by him, because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and because of all the evil things that Herod had done, added to them all by shutting up John in prison. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The beginning of this section, the first few verses, where we run through this list of all these different rulers and all these in all these different places. The calendar as we know it didn't really come into existence until after 500 AD, the idea of it being dated from the time of Christ forward. Before that, time was always given by very different markers. Often it was by the reign of a ruler, um, or in many cases it was dated from the, the founding of the city of Rome. Um, the dates were always a bit fluid. Even as late as the Middle Ages, people would still date things that way. They wouldn't necessarily tell you the year. They would tell you in the first year of the reign of our liege lord's father, old King Edward, we did such and such. And, and so this idea of time was always a little more fluid. It's not as precise as we like to have it now. We like to think that we are controlling it. You know, we have all our calendars and all our planners, and I am so guilty of this. I have so many calendars and planners everywhere. Um, we have the time on everything. It's on our computers and on our phones and on our televisions, and it, I mean, it's everywhere. And I haven't even gotten into watches because who wears one of those anymore? Unless it's an Apple watch that also tells you your heart rate, your pulse, it gives you, you know, the oxygen rate you have go, it tells you everything. How many steps you've taken that day? But this idea of wanting to be really precise about where we are and when we are and when exactly everything happened and we want to know right now what exactly is going on. And yet, we don't, do we? In this case, even with all these markers, the best we can come up with is about a four-year span of time, somewhere between probably 26 to 28, maybe as late as 30, maybe, you know, because when all those different people overlapped, and we're not entirely sure because, well, you know, Tiberius, he co-ruled with Augustus for a while, and I mean, there's not a precise date. It doesn't say on June 4th. No. Because that wasn't what was important. What was important was what John said. Now Luke was still trying to get all his ducks in a row and get everything organized. But he's still doing it as a person of his time, which is very, very different from how we would do it. I remember as a kid when I was learning how to write um, I remember this whole exercise we'd have to do where you'd have to answer all the questions. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. you got to answer all of them in your essay. And that's not, and that's part of the issue we always have with scripture, is that's not the way they construct the world. That's not how they told time. That's not how they did a lot of things. You know, very often... The why was much more important 
than the when and the where and it didn't matter. What was important was what, you know, what was important to John? Why did John say this? Why was John doing what he was doing? And so the first two chapters of Luke are telling us why John was doing what he was doing. Because he was the prophet. He was the voice in the wilderness. That was his role and his function. From before he was born, that's what was planned for him. He would be the voice in the wilderness. Calling the people to repentance, preparing the way for the Messiah. I've said it before, John's one of the few people who knew exactly what he was going to do his entire life, without a doubt. Even if his parents had wanted him to do something else, no, this was his role. And so here we have, you know, this is supposed to be about Jesus' baptism, but when you read through the third chapter of Luke, you realize there's only two verses on the baptism of Jesus. It's a tag on kind of at the end. The important part here is what did John say? This is the only shot we get really to see John's ministry. And so what does he say? We had two chapters of birth narratives and babies and angels and isn't this sweet? And what are the first words John says? You brood of vipers. Who told you that it was time to repent? Wow. I mean, what a way to start. The people are coming to him wanting him to baptize them, trying to figure out what it is they're supposed to do. And he calls them a brood of vipers. He doesn't say, welcome, come in, sit down, let's talk. Let me explain to you what's going to happen. No, you brood of vipers. In it for yourselves. All about saving your own skins. This has nothing to do with true repentance. This is only about you trying to get ahead and make sure you've got everything covered when the time comes. What John was calling them to was a true repentance. That's what he keeps emphasizing here, that this isn't just about going through the motions, coming in, seeing the water, having some water lovingly placed on your head, and going about your business. That's never what this was about. The water, the baptism was just a sign. Reminiscent of all the purification rituals that the Jews would go through. It was supposed to just be a sign that you had repented. That you had changed. That you had listened to God. And that you were living the way the prophets had always said you should. It was about changing, repenting, turning around, becoming the new person you were supposed to have been all along. He challenges them to bear fruits worthy of repentance. You know, by their fruits you shall know them. This whole imagery, you know, comes up so much in the New Testament about you know, the fruits that we bear. And Jesus plays into this metaphor too. One of the things, though, that he really gets on them about is people were inclined to say, one of their excuses was, well, we're the children of Abraham. We're good. We're covered. You know, God's promises to send to us, and so we're all fine. So I don't need to do any of this. And what he's telling them is, that's not going to save you. That God can pick a whole new bunch of children. In fact, he could even take the stones on the ground and make children of them to replace all of you. And that's something that I'm sure, you know, shook people to their core. That what do you mean? Everything I've lived, I mean, everything I've understood about who I am and where I stand in the world, you're now telling me is wrong. 
that's something that that folks were really going to have to wrestle with and come to grips with and try to figure out what to do with. So it's not shocking that that many would be almost in a panic. What do we do? Which is what the question they keep getting, what are we supposed to do now? What do you mean? If everything that I've held on to as my reason for who I am and where I am and how I relate to the world is now wrong, what do I do? How do I understand everything now? Their, you know, ethnic heritage wasn't going to save them. It was their repentance that was going to bring them into right relationship with God. It had nothing to do with who they were. It had everything to do with what they did and how they acted and how they behaved. Three different groups come to John and ask him this. And when you think about the answer he gives, they're all really concrete. There's nothing esoteric here. It's very concrete things. It's, you know, you need to share what you have. If you have two cloaks, you need to give one to somebody who doesn't have one. You need to share your food and your resources with those who don't have any. You know, if you're a tax collector, you should only be collecting what's prescribed for you to collect, not try to get as much out of people as you can. If you're a soldier, you should not be shaking people down to bring them justice. You should simply accept your wages and do your job. This is what he's telling people, that you need to be honorable. You need to do what your role in life is. You need to be honest and true about treating your neighbors as yourself. You need to live that every day. So for some, this was shocking. It was a shock to hear this, that everything they knew about themselves wasn't enough, that simply being wasn't enough. There were actions to be done. There was action to be taken. The final section here then, as you know, you get to the end of John's message, it talks about the Messiah coming. And John is really clear that he is not the Messiah. Not at all. His job is to announce the kingdom. And any reference he makes to the Messiah is to somebody else. That the Messiah is coming very soon. And that John himself is not worthy to untie his sandals. Which, by the way, was a job that was only fit for slaves. Even disciples were never expected to untie the sandals of the master. Not ever. That was a job for slaves. And so John is saying he's even beneath the slaves in comparison to the Messiah. That he's not even fit to be on the same ground as the Messiah is. He is so far beneath. Which is not a way we're accustomed to hearing people speak of themselves. To literally say that they're the dirt under someone's shoes. I mean, that's not how we're used to hearing people talk about themselves. But let's think about all of John's message here. I think one of the big things to take note of is the temptation that we all fall into for you know, self-justification, trying to justify who we are and what we do. We don't like to admit that we're wrong. We don't like to admit that we screwed up. And we all do that. I mean, how many, you know, I always loved the, the comments people would make about, you know, how honest and truthful and wonderful children are. Yeah, they're not. They learn very quickly how to lie to try to cover their own skins. Um, 
one of my favorite stories with our kids, because there's about an eight year age gap between the oldest and the youngest. And poor Katie, I mean, she, she, she learned quickly how to give it as good as she got it. But I can still remember she wasn't walking yet. So she was maybe a year old. And somebody had gotten up to something. Odds are good it was Robert, because it was always Robert. But somebody, like, they knocked something off the wall or done something, and a big crash and bang and all this stuff. Okay. So I come out, and of course, they're all there, and but no one had done it. And they all start pointing fingers at each other, including Katie. She pointed her finger at one of her brothers, because that's what they did. So that's what she did was point. And I'm like... They were trying to blame her and I'm like she can't walk she couldn't have climbed onto the couch onto the back on it to get up she couldn't have done it guys and she's even pointing like I didn't do it mom yeah we all learn how to justify our behavior and how to shift the blame and push it all somewhere else from the time we're little because we don't want to admit to our weaknesses and to our failures that's not, you know, it's not our proudest moments, you know, it's not something we want to admit. And so this temptation to justify ourselves, I mean, it's universal. We all do it because we all want to appear better than we are. We don't want people to think ill of us. So we try so hard to justify it. You know, think about... The rationalizations we use to dismiss God's call to us. Oh, well, I can't move. And, and well, I need those things. I can't give them away. Um, I don't have extra time to do that stuff. I don't, I don't, I, I'm not the one to do that. Someone else, I'm too busy. I have too many things going on. I can't be the one. Think of all the ways we rationalize out and push away God's call. I cannot tell you the number of people over the years who have said to me some version of, yeah, I really felt called to be in ministry or be a missionary, but I just, I, I just couldn't do it then. You know, I, I, I wanted to get married and I had kids and I had a job and so I couldn't do it. Okay. So did I, but it's, it's this understanding that we know better. So we'll come up with any reason to not have to face the discomfort of doing something we might not be spectacular at, or that we're unsure of how good we'll be at it. All the rationalizations we use. Well, you know, we're, we're the best, so, you know, we, we don't need to do those other things. Are we really? Or it's all just about my personal relationship with God. It has nothing to do with how I relate to anybody else. Really? Is that what John said? No. It's about how we treat our neighbors. By their fruits, you know them. So if we're not putting forth that fruit to share with the world, have we really repented and turned around? That's the question we have to ask. And it's a hard one to ask because we have lots of really good reasons for why we're, we're better than we really are because we don't want to admit it. We don't want to admit that we have weaknesses and that we have faults and that we're not particularly good at some things and that we really can't stand some people and that there's some things we just don't want to do. And why do I have to be the one to do it? Don't we all do that? And that's exactly what John is getting at. Going through the motions of getting baptized and saying, oh yes, I got it covered, isn't enough. That's not enough for who we need to be and what we need to do. 
We're supposed to be changing our life, changing our lifestyle, changing the way we do things. We should seem odd to most of the world. We shouldn't just blend right into everything. We should seem a bit off because we should do things differently. Our experience with God isn't something that's controllable in many regards. I mean, the way that God comes into our lives, the way that God works within us, we should feel a bit out of control. We should feel a bit off kilter. We should feel that maybe we don't know what's coming next. I mean, God's acting within our lives in ways that defy explanation sometimes. Defy what, you know, powers and institutions tell us we should be doing. God calls us to genuine repentance and commitment and covenant. And those are words that we don't hear much in our world. And yet... They're all part of who we are. We too need to be called to something different. This isn't just water. It's a sign that we've been called to be different, to view the world different, to react different, to not just go along with the crowd, running all in the same direction, we're to be different. We're to repent and turn around and go the other way. All of that in one short sermon from John and all of that to prepare the ground for what comes next. And what's next is Jesus praying at his own baptism, and the Spirit of the Lord descending, and nothing ever being the same ever again. And in the coming weeks, that's what we'll get to talk about, is all the different ways that Jesus changed the world then and is changing it now. And so with all that in mind, let us pray. Dear God, help us to find a way to a true repentance to a turning around, to a new way with you. Help us to not be like everyone else. Help us to live your words so that others can recognize that within us. Help us to live out the fruits of that repentance so that all the world may share in them. Help us to reflect on these words of John the Baptist and the repentance and baptism that he called us to. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we continue. Last year was a wonderful year in so many ways. So many unexpected blessings that occurred. Um, I just want to take a moment right now. Um, I received the card and Christmas gift from you guys on Christmas Eve and it was truly unexpected and truly wonderful and I am so appreciative and so grateful to all of you for that. Um, it was it was really wonderful. It has been a tough year for all of us, but it was so, it, it just brought so much joy to me to know that, that, you know, so many of you think that much of, of me and of, and of us and of my family. Um, just really appreciate it from all of you. So, 
as we start 2021, just know that we're, we're all still, you know, plugging along, doing the best we can, but, but our church is still doing some wonderful and amazing things. And, and it's been such a joy this past year to be able to share that with all of you. Um, I am so excited that, that we were able to, you know, to get everything settled and, and, and have the vote on my being pastor, you know, a grand total of two weeks before we had to lock down for the pandemic. Um, but I think it, it just, the timing was, was really good. Um, it was really perfect for all of us because then at least we knew we had the path together and we're going, um, whatever came. So that's what we're going to continue to do this year and, and keep moving forward. So, um, as many of you know, I'm no longer the stated clerk for the Presbyteries of Des Moines and North Central Iowa. My term ended December 31st. Um, I woke up January 1 and went, yes, because <laughs> so much email stopped. It was fabulous. Um, but I do have a new position that uh, part-time that I'm going to be beginning this next week. Um, I'm going to be the administrator for the Iowa Youth Chorus. And I am so excited about doing this. It'll be something a little different, but still using lots of office skills I've had over the years. Um, and I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Get to meet lots of new people and, and do some different things. And I think that'll be good for them and for me. So I am looking forward to that. I am looking forward to continuing on all that we're doing together. And we've already got some things planned for, for Lent and and for all kinds of stuff. So with all that said, thank you so much for, for everything and for continuing to stick together and, and, and be the church. So now let's sing together the doxology. with me in the prayer of dedication. God of heaven and earth, you call us to come in humility before you, bringing the offering of our very selves. As you revealed Jesus to be your son in his baptism at the hand of John, so you claimed our lives in baptism, that we might die to sin and be raised with him to new life. Accept all we have and all we are, O God, in the service of Jesus Christ, and strengthen us with your spirit's power now and forever. Amen. Well, we're going to continue with our time of communion. And what we will do is I'll start part of the Great Thanksgiving and in the middle we'll we'll have our our pastoral prayer and Lord's prayer and then finish out and share communion together. So let's begin. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O God of mercy and might. In your wisdom you made all things and sustained them by your power. You have called forth men and women in every age to be your servants and speak your word. When we rebelled against your call and turned from your ways, in your love you called us back to you. You delivered us from captivity and made covenant to be our sovereign God. You sent prophets to call us to justice and compassion. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, in whom you have revealed yourself, our light and our salvation. Baptized in Jordan's waters, Jesus took his place with sinners, and your voice proclaimed him your beloved. Your spirit anointed him to bring good news to the poor to proclaim release to the captives, to restore sight to the blind, and to free the oppressed. He lived among us in power and grace, touching broken lives with your healing presence. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, 
and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. Dear God, on this day, we come before you with so many thoughts swirling around. We know that you call us to compassion and to mercy on behalf of all those who are in need. We know that you call us to be your hands and feet in the world, to bring your light to all those who have need of it. And so Lord, this day we pray. We pray for the church and its leaders that we may, through our witness and service, prepare the way to you. We pray for the creation, that we may prepare your way by working to heal and restore the damage we've caused. We pray for all the nations of the world and our own, that we may prepare your way by proclaiming your justice and your peace for all people. For those who are, are lonely, for those who are isolated, may we prepare your way by sharing your comfort and your love with all those who need it. For all those on our prayer list, those struggling with illness, those struggling after losing family members, those struggling with jobs and, and not being able to see one another, may we prepare your way by surrounding them with compassion and with comfort and with love. May we prepare your way by bearing witness to your grace and your mercy in our lives. Lord God, you revealed your son in the waters of the Jordan, and you anointed him with the power of the Holy Spirit to proclaim good news to all the people. Touch us with the same spirit, that we may proclaim the healing power of the gospel by acts of love in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day your daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Remembering your gracious acts in Jesus Christ, we take from your creation this bread and this cup and joyfully celebrate Christ dying and rising as we await the day of his coming. With thanksgiving, we offer our very selves to you to be a living and holy sacrifice dedicated to your service. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. On the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup and after blessing it he said this cup is the new testament shed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins as often as you drink of it do this in remembrance of me the gifts of god for the people of god Thanks be to God. Let us pray. We give you thanks and praise, O God, that you have fed us with your mercy and poured out your spirit in this place. Continue to nourish and fill us each day, that we may live as your beloved people, 
In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our closing hymn is Come Thou Font of Every Blessing. these words of benediction. You go nowhere by accident. Wherever you go, God is sending you. Wherever you are, God has put you there. God has a purpose in your being there. Christ lives in you and has something he wants to do through you wherever you are. Believe this and go in the grace and the love and the power of Jesus Christ. Amen. Go in peace.